This episode is brought to you by the geocache type, multicache, often overlooked and much less common today than in early days, but still more likely to provide a bigger adventure for those days when only getting one smiley for the find isn't such a bad thing. Look one up in your area and show it some love. This is TGIF Geocaching Radio, a monthly audio show all about geocaching and the excellent adventures that await us. And I'm Jeff, aka The Bruce Zero. So stay tuned and let's hang out. Here's a quick history lesson I came across recently I thought you'd be interested in. Back in the old days, cowboys would hang a lantern on their saddles at night so they could find and see the trail when they were far from home. Obviously, they didn't have the technology we have now, and there were many forms of orienteering over the centuries. But this really was the uh, dawn of saddle light navigation. <clears throat> Okay, back to seriousness. In case you missed it, I just wrapped up this year's Christmas special called Geopodmas. It was a story of Tiny Tim. Uh, He came to me years ago, and he helped lead to some challenges during Geovlogmas. And and these were themes all about giving and bringing back some levity to the season, especially when it was dark over the last couple of years. We did things like a next-to-find hashtag, That one was all about dropping in a nice gift into geocaches for the next person to find as a free giveaway. So with maybe a little bit of a card or a writing saying, hey, you don't have to trade for this. You can take it and, you know, you can have fun wrapping it up and it can be something like gift cards. It's probably the easiest for uh, sizes of geocaches, but just something to brighten the day of the next to find, the next finder of the geocache. And of course, people who did this could share what they did with the hashtag next to find and just help to spread the joy. The first one that Tiny Tim actually did was the Christmas tree bomb hashtag challenge. And that spawned because there were a few times where I had just been out hiking various times in the year and come across a tree that had Christmas decorations on it. (laughs) And I thought it was so neat. And it just brought a little bit of a smile and reminder about Christmas that wasn't there at that time, but coming soon. And so I thought, you know, around Christmas, it would be neat to be able to uh, to spread a little bit of that kind of cheer by finding a tree and decorating it. And of course, without littering, so people were encouraged to remember where the tree was and then at the end of the holiday, go back and pick up all of the decorations. Go back and seto your Christmas tree bomb. <laughs> and then there was hashtag Dear 2021, encouraging people to write about some of the best parts of 2020 and what they hope for in 2021 because that was the first year of the pandemic and who knows what kind of things people were going through. So just an attempt to uh, focus on the good and the positive moving into the new year. And so this year for 2022, decided to go with audio and uh, that is a very different platform. And instead of going out and vlogging daily geocaching, I decided to flesh out some of the characters, the plot and the concepts, and really help build like a, a story world around the Cash the Line brand, about uh, the Cash Line. So it was a little bit of an experiment, uh, stepping out and trying something a little different. And it really helped me gain a lot of respect for people who do Foley in uh, major films, <laughs> or even just audio dramas, radio dramas, and whatnot, because trying to uh, fill up the audio with nice special effects and just make things feel more tangible and happening uh, right before your ears uh, takes a lot of work <laughs> to find the good sounds and the ambient backgrounds. It was it was a little bit of a challenge, but it was fun to do on a daily basis and. Uh, I think it was excess, and I really appreciate a lot of the positive feedback and comments that were received for it, and I really wanted to make sure that it didn't leave behind that geocaching hobby, but really tied into that activity, as well as building out the characters. And now with other projects also in development, I think we'll be seeing more of the cache line, those little characters, some big characters, some places, and more adventures. 
So if you missed it, then you can visit cashtheline.net slash geopodmas or check the podcast episodes leading up to this show. You know, storytelling can be so engaging and I think it's kind of a relatively untapped area in this hobby. Of course, we have the, uh, the Geocaching International Film Festival, the GIF, and that draws people worldwide into these creative zones. And there have been novels and books written in various genres connecting with the activity. And of course, not the least of which is a recent addition to the collection from the geocaching vlogger himself, Joshua Johnson, the comic adventure called The Greatest Treasure. Uh, that was illustrated by Rich Schleifer, 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 <laughs> or Komakino from Komakino and the Kid on YouTube. And you can find and buy that comic on Amazon.com or .ca or .whatever your country is. <laughs> and it seems like storytelling in this particular activity really draws only a certain type of demographic, certainly not the whole community. So, I mean, who knows? If the word spreads, maybe we can populate that story-driven fantasy adventuring demographic for those times when we're not actively out searching for geocaches and can read or listen or play board games. But that also really brings me back to my childhood. Uh, I, when, when I was a kid, I used to love playing hide-and-seek. Uh, with my best friend, we played marbles. That was when marbles were popular, so we had these bags of uh, clinky-clacky glass beads. And uh, so we'd often go to our basements and hide them, taking turns. And uh, as we kept count of how many were hidden and how many we found, we'd go scavenging around. And, uh, and, and finding them hidden in all these little nooks and crannies. They could be under things like couches or desks or TV uh, stands and whatnot, or they could require a little bit of climbing up some shelves. It was kind of a little adventure for, <laughs> for little kids in the basements. And, uh, but we made our own fun. And then there was Easter, where uh, myself and my friends and, and uh, some extended family, we loved doing Easter egg hunts. With my extended family living on a farm, we'd often have that enormous yard to go searching. And most would actually be full-sized eggs, because they live on a farm, <laughs> but painted. And in the house, they'd be little those little uh, chocolate foil-wrapped eggs. Saves on space, and they're a little more fun because they're chocolate. But that's the little kind of activity that can be fun, whether it's one person, two, or however many. And it, uh, it also taught us how to scavenge, to be comfortable getting a little dirty, uh, learning about levels of success, because you might find a lot or you might find little, having more or less in the end. It was a great activity for kids growing up. And that really <laughs> translated well to this grown-up version of the game of geocaching, hide-and-seek. Uh, I don't tend to like to prefer it as treasure hunting, because it, it is more about, to me, the the journey and the adventure, the activity, the nature, then specifically what's inside the geocaches. But it's awesome to see how far this hobby has come. And as more and more people join who have special skills or special knowledge and abilities, it's just, it's just crazy how it expands and ignites people's minds and creativity and encourages such a healthy lifestyle. And it's been 22 years officially since the hobby began. And looking back over this year, it's just been a wild ride. <laughs> this summer was intense with so many activities and events, uh, especially in North America uh, and, and various other countries as well as the world slowly started opening up again. So finally, we had the opportunity to celebrate 20 years of geocaching in 2022 with Geocaching Headquarters who are giving us another two souvenirs to round out the new year, dropping anchor on 2022 if you find a geocache or attend an event on the last week of the year, and set sail 2023 doing the same sometime in the first week of the new year. And we'll be looking back at some of this year's events and highlights right after we come back from this little break. Users of the official geocaching app on iOS and Android will have noticed that the latest update has renamed a couple of log types. The needs maintenance log type is now named owner attention requested and the needs archived log type is now called reviewer attention requested. This has been a request that's been discussed off and on over the years and it seems as though HQ has implemented it and also informed that the change will be replicated on the website and throughout the API early in the next year in 2023. 
So watch for that because effectively they're the same, but now the labels are a little more relevant to their purpose. If you have thoughts, opinions, or rants about that, then please comment below or send an email to tgif at cashtheline.net. Love it or hate it, headquarters has recently announced that a smaller and older section of geocaching.com will sadly be retired entirely in the new year. You may have heard about benchmarking, an early side game to geocaching where headquarters imported a database of known NGS benchmarks in the United States and allowed people to find and post logs reporting on them. It's a sort of niche pastime that fit well with the geocaching hobby. Benchmarks are most recognized as those flat and round disks embedded most often in the ground or large solid rocks in the wilderness or sometimes in cornerstones of large old buildings. They would track the location for navigation and orienteering and map building and many are still in use today and can still sometimes lead to new understanding of shifts in the earth, but many have been lost or broken over time. So hobbyists enjoy finding them and documenting their current state, but not being natively a geocaching activity and with the system itself running on very, very old code, headquarters has made the difficult call of retiring that segment of the website in the new year. What does that mean? All benchmarks, logs, and history will be cleared and removed from the website but the user statistics of how many you've logged will remain in your profile. But that's about it. If you haven't yet, you may want to capture your logs and notes in case you want to move that activity over to waymarking.com where there is a benchmarking category or make use of the NGS benchmarking database directly. Sadly, it seems no more can be done to save that part of US history within the geocaching database, so find them before they're gone. Well, the benchmarks won't be gone but the benchmarking on the website will be. <laughs> Another stark reminder to use common sense recently occurred in New Zealand in early December where police were called in due to a bomb scare, only to find out that it was an official geocache. There were minor disruptions, but no one was hurt. This happens occasionally over the years, but it's absolutely paramount that if you hide a geocache, you make every effort not to give it the appearance of something potentially explosive. And this one is a great example, an enclosed pipe magnetically attached to a surface in an urban area. Imitation explosive devices are a big no-no. Geocaching has grown ever more into urban environments, and with it there's always a risk of someone misinterpreting a hidden container. But as responsible geocachers, we can make every effort to keep it safe and family friendly. A police spokesperson said, please apply some common sense to where you put them and be aware that people will come looking for them and they may be disrupting others, especially in urban areas. And as Hazoi quipped in the geocaching forums, metal pipes do not make for good geocaches because they make for good bombs. And there's another reason why I tend to prefer caching in the woods over urban caching. <laughs> On a lighter note, until February 6th, you can earn two souvenirs by helping Signal escape the castle, earning points by finding geocaches, attending events, and completing adventure labs. It's the latest adventure in Signal's Labyrinth series of souvenir promotions that will be running until April of 2023. Attending events awards the most points this round, and the bonus items you may find randomly with every geocache logged through the Labyrinth is a gas lantern. So get exploring and help him through the maze. Do you have any news to report? Or have any questions, comments, rants, funny stories, milestones, accomplishments, or adventures to share? Drop an email to tgif at cashtheline.net or phone one in and leave a message at cashtheline.net slash POI. All links mentioned throughout the show will also be available in the show notes and episode description. So perhaps your area is a little different than mine, but events around here are fairly common but it seems like the vast majority are always the same people attending, usually within an hour or two drive, but some are even more. I feel like we need to adopt some way of getting the word out to the local communities about events. I know there's so many active geocaches in the area, but we never seem to see them. Have you seen that in your area as well? It used to be with the newsletter that upcoming local events were included in your emailed version. I don't know how effective that was, but I feel like it could be more effective now. Let's try to get hold of more locals and new geocachers and invite them to events. Maybe that could be a 2023 resolution. And on that note, we have an excellent etiquette tip suggested by Geocacher Ken in Manitoba. 
This is something I know I've been guilty of recently, mainly because there's so many events around here and deciding on schedules has been getting difficult. I want to attend all the things, but as event hosts will attest, we really need to be more proactive in posting our will attend logs on events. There are benefits, not only a visible reminder about the event, but they appear green in the little calendar on your profile dashboard if you're using the new dashboard at geocaching.com slash account slash dashboard. It also helps the host prepare with an estimate of numbers, especially when it comes to events in restaurants or other buildings where there may be limited space or reservations, or if they're intending to have snacks and refreshments. (laughs) So if you even think you're going to attend, visit the cash page and post a will attend log. Even if you say that it's still a maybe for now, it's generally better than a whole gang showing up entirely unexpected. And I think that'll be a resolution for me as well. Well, that was one heck of a walk around this park. Just finished up with uh, an event, and there's a new adventure lab. There's also an old adventure lab, and that one had a bonus. So I managed to find all the stages, figure out where the bonus cache was, (laughs) and now, joy, the hint is uh, hanging on a hawthorn tree, basically, and oh my gosh, these things, oh man. If you don't know what a hawthorn tree is, these have about an inch and a half long thorns. Oh, you can hear them on my jacket. Oh, and oh, there's a rose bush down here. We've got the tiny thorns. Oh, oh, oh I see it. <laughs> Owie. Oh, these things can leave a good scratch. Oh, okay, no holes in the jacket, please. Oh, look at here. There's a container here. Oh, love that sound. Log book. Yeah. That is another adventure lab in the books. Geocaching ASMR. And there's the log book. Time to sign the log book. Have you ever cached through a hawthorn bush? (laughs) Oh, what an adventure that is. Well, now as we say goodbye to this little audio geocaching adventure, listen to the logbook. What would you rate a cache? Something like this, where you've got to push through a dense bush of needles that can puncture your skin, tear your clothes. Ah, smiley on the map. Comment below, send me an email. On that note, see ya in the next saga. It is time for the Patron Adventurer of the Month. Cash the Line is supported by a band of excellent adventurers through Patreon who graciously pitch in and help the channel continue to grow and improve. And for this show, our Patron Adventurer of the Month is Houston, Texas Dave. Dave is a great supporter of a number of influencers and has been a most excellent voice in the community, encouraging and interacting with people in the hobby. Good influencers don't always have to be media creators. Thank you to Dave for your ongoing support of Cash the Line. You can help support Cash the Line and unlock bonus content and swag, including participating in Project EGA, by visiting patreon.com slash cash the line. Patreon.com slash cash the line. Your support is appreciated. So, with 2022 drawing to a close, let's check back on some highlights from the year. Now, we all should know by now that Geocaching Headquarters' 20th anniversary celebrations had been postponed for two years. And I think they did a good job of the rebranding of to uh, to 20 in 22. (laughs) I think if it would have had to be postponed again, they may have just waited until the 25th anniversary of Geocaching in three three more years. (laughs) But the world and traveling had opened up enough, it was legal and deemed safe enough to allow many thousands from around the world to converge on Seattle. The location of activities were moved to a larger outdoor area, and there were still limitations in numerous places on attendees, and some health regulations still affect indoors. 
But it was wonderful to be able to have people from so many nations finally able to visit Ground Zero. <laughs> from the original stash plaque to the ape cache, and even visiting headquarters office itself. That's a tough one to get into with limited reservations through the week of celebrations. And having the outdoor stage for speakers and entertainment was a great touch to provide more for people to enjoy throughout the official event day. On top of that, Geo Woodstock was also postponed for two years, and with Canada also opening up enough to have a similarly large outdoor event north of the border, thousands also attended Canada's first giga event, and that was GC86VDF. That took place a week before headquarters celebrations. That was always the hope and intent, I think, and it made it very convenient for foreign travelers, especially. And the two events being very short drive apart from each other meant there was a whole lot of geocaching going on between Seattle and Vancouver, including opportunities to check out, to check out the, uh, the GPS Adventures Maze exhibit, uh, and that was GC9RW7C. Now, those two main events were probably the largest for North America, though I can't speak for those European events, but certainly highlight events for 2022. And with two years of postponed events, I th was very excited to be able to finally cross the border, which meant while I missed the Mingo Madness event in 2021, I could thankfully attend the Worldwide Cash Fest in Memphis in Tennessee. If you missed out on that event, it was the first of its kind, at least in person, <laughs> hosted by the Geocache Talk Network. Last year, you may have heard of Worldwide CacheCon. That was the online virtual mega event. CacheFest, though, was the first live version. That was GC9E5GX. The event was designed around three academies based on three significant geocaching topics, also covered by three of the Geocache Talk Network podcasts. There was the Gad Gadget Academy, the Puzzle Academy, and the Challenge Academy. And you can check out all the details about Cash Fest, which is returning to Memphis in 2023. That's GC9ZEFF. Post your will attends <laughs> at www.cashfest.com. I was privileged to be able to help out with the Challenge Academy with Emily Renee as we co-hosted the Challenge Talk podcast together. It was also neat to have been able to design the Academy shirts following each theme. And did you attend Cash Fest? If you have, you can add the badge to your profile, marking your attendance. Visit the trackable with the instructions at cord.info slash tb8gen... <laughs> Let me say that again. Cord.info, C-O-O-R-D dot info slash tb8jnee. -E. <laughs> and then each year, I also get excited about the annual camping event, Midwest Geobash in Wauseon, Ohio. For me, it's just a hop over the border, but I'm a big fan of just simple camping, car camping. And this event has been around for years with many attendees not having missed more than just a couple of years. Being on a campground means claiming lots and setting up shop, whether it's a tent, an RV, or a car, like myself. Each year has a theme and activities throughout the week within the grounds making it very convenient to enjoy your time there. <laughs> there are, of course, always new geocaches placed for the event in the surrounding region, so it's a great variety of stuff for everyone. I haven't yet got to the point of decorating my own campsite for the competition, but maybe one year. I missed out on last year's Geobash event, but if you hadn't heard, the weather down there was frightful. The event was literally flooded out with many vehicles up past the rims in flood water from the massive storm that had rolled through. Thankfully, this year was just perfect. For Midwest Geobash in 2023, they've even begun promoting by allowing people to host Halfway to Bash events on January 21st, each listed in the bookmark list, which you can find at coord.info slash bmbrfmf. If you're near one, you should attend. Most are around Ohio and uh, neighboring states, but as of right now, we have one in Ontario, and there's one even being hosted in Florida. <laughs> All right, let's get to some other general geocaching highlights of 2022. This year's big souvenir promotion by headquarters, mixed up with some common ones, is Signals Labyrinth. These little souvenir promos are a fun way to enhance our geocaching activities, and I think this is a very well-themed series. Every two months, Signal and his Geopup tracker are faced with a new challenge, a new maze in their adventures, and with every find we make, they progress forward. 
The challenge, of course, is to find your way out of the maze by gathering enough points by claiming fines or attending events or finishing adventure labs. This year, they've faced an enchanted forest, a swamp, a troll's cave, a hedge maze, and a castle. Now, I'm a huge fan of creative storytelling, and I love the theming with these. I think there could be a great opportunity for more storytelling and character building here. Especially now that Signal's got a sidekick. Why are they facing these mazes? Are they just geocaching, or are they on a mission of some kind? I'd love to see Headquarters play with some more story-driven content in 2023. That doesn't mean story has to be followed by people. Many just want to play and earn stuff, but I think there's just so much potential here. Speaking of souvenirs, early in 2022, they dubbed the year the Year of the Hide, promoting a focus on quality geocache hiding and refreshing the game board. Hiding or hosting an event in 2022 would earn you this souvenir, and now they're extending it through 2023 as well. This is a worldwide game, and you know, it's, it's really hard to figure out how active or stale any community is. Some are thriving with players and packed with geocaches, and some just seem to have difficulty boosting their local activity. So really, anything to nudge people towards participating more is good in my books. Souvenirs are a quaint way to do that. I also like the uh, special once-off souvenirs like Deuces Wild, which was awarded to anyone who logged two geocaches on February 22nd, 2022. 22 <laughs> We saw another batch of virtual rewards launched, the opportunity to refresh the game board with a limited amount of new virtual geocaches. When they're created in good places, they can be a really great way to explore and discover, and I think having them as limited batches for people who know or understand them better is a good idea. They shouldn't be littered everywhere, but I think they're fundamentally much more rare a thing than containers that can be hidden every 161 <laughs> meters. I think my favorite virtual so far has been the climb up the Sleeping Giant at uh, Thunder Bay in Ontario, which I made a video about. No physical geocache there, just an extreme and remote geological location requiring a photo at ground zero after a half-day journey. It was fantastic. They don't have to be so extreme, but that's my kind of virtual. On top of that, we had a new locationless cache created, an even more rare cache type, the third of its modern incarnation, it's GC9FAVE, and it prompts you to share a location you discovered because of geocaching. These new locationless caches work in reverse. Instead of going to one location to find something, you post a log from the location you're at, doing what the cache describes, much like a simple challenge. The originals also required including coordinates so that each log was verified and had to be unique. These are good to be extremely rare and controlled by headquarters, though it's a whole lot of logging going on. <laughs> Snag the Tag had an active year this year. New Snag games included No More Secrets, Celestial Wizards, Beam Me Up UFOs, and uh, Celestial Witches, plus some smaller location-specific games. It's another side game to geocaching based on striving to be the actual first to find on little tags that could be hidden around the world that would allow you to claim and win its partner geocoin. Literal FTF means there can be only one finder. And if you're not the first, you don't pick up and keep that hidden tag. You don't get the geocoin. It's a very fun and competitive and collectible idea for a niche demographic. 2022 saw the theft of the oldest active geocache in the world, Mingo GC30. That very beloved countryside geocache in the middle of nowhere was victim to, well, essentially a smash and grab. The uh, commemorative plaque that was placed nearby during Mingo Madness for its 20-year birthday identifying the location was removed along with the geocache itself. It takes a special kind of person to do a direct attack like that. But Mingo lives on. Being one of the most beloved geocaches, there is no doubt that it would be replaced and its legacy live on. Will Mingo ever go away? I'm betting that it won't. May 11th, 2000 is a day that will live in... In fame... In... in not infamously. In famousness. <laughs> and then my summer of 22 trips began with a road trip loop down to Memphis for Cache Fest and up to Wauseon for Midwest Geobash. My planning for geocaches to find on that trip was based almost entirely around working on challenge caches. <laughs> In Ontario, we have so many cross-border challenges, so any opportunity to find rare geocaches in the U.S. is one worth taking. 
But a big one I managed to complete right from day one was the California Fizzy, GC11E8N. That's not just any full DT grid, but one that's composed only of geocaches placed before April 6th, 2007. That requires a lot of travel and planning to complete, and the closest geocache that could fill my final DT combo was in the USA, so border lockdowns were a little painful for the last couple years. That meant it was a primary target on the trip, and there will be a video of that adventure coming soon. (laughs) But what a trip this was. I finally got to try Zaxby's for the first time, got to see Elvis live in concert. Well, it was Joshua Johnson performing Blue Suede Shoes at Cash Fest. (laughs) And met so many amazing people along the way who autographed my little logbook. This was what a good road trip should be made of. After returning home, it was a two-week break before heading out again into the West to BC and Seattle for those events. My Geomobile... Geomobile... My Geomobile Deja joined me and merged with the Jeep that I picked up through Turo.com, which is an awesome website. It's like the Airbnb of car rentals. And that Jeep's name was Thor. (laughs) So for another two weeks, my partner in crime was Deja Thor. Couldn't have asked for a better partner. (laughs) While out west, I also scaled the side of a cliff. Okay, maybe it was exaggerating just a bit. With uh, Cody Cash and climbed Mount Margaret for the third time to visit Washington's oldest cache, GCD, and hiked the Snoqualmie Tunnel for the second time to properly visit and log the real ape cache, and even had a chance to make my own Funko Pop character, Mini B Vlogger. (laughs) It was, frankly, about the best experience I've had with two major vacations within two months in one summer, filled with geocaching, adventures, people, exploring... And this is geocaching to me. And there are oodles of videos to come from the summer of 22 on YouTube for Cash the Line. It really felt like going out on a high note as well, because shortly after returning, I had decided that it was time to turn in my mic, figuratively speaking, from co-hosting the Challenge Talk podcast on the Geocache Talk network. It was a show launched just after the pandemic began, an idea I popped over to Gary and Jesse, who'd also been thinking about the topic, And with co-host Emily Dinsmore, the show took off like a racehorse. I was always concerned with how much could be discussed even in a monthly show, but I think it was just about right. And we had guests and prizes and the wheel of challenges that I whipped together for a visual component, hoping to give a bit of incentive for listeners to improve some general personal geocaching statistics to be more well-rounded in experiences and travels in the hopes to qualify for a random challenge and win more prizes. After two years while also running my own channel and trying to maintain life and value people in it above all, it was time to move on. After seeing Cash Fest, a huge success, and organizing the Challenge Academy, my role in the podcast is now Emily's, and she's done wonderfully since then. So if you love challenge caching, that is the monthly show for you. Second Sunday of each month on the Geocache Talk Network. As time rolls on, we saw the loss of a well-known geological feature in Prince Edward Island, the teacup rock shown in GC8A2C. Storms, nature, and time was too much for the structure, and sadly it toppled. That is the way of nature. Things change, and sometimes for the worse, sometimes for the better. And in my region, we also saw the loss of a very well-known and beloved geocacher, Buttons, who had made his rounds with many excellent adventures. Let's remember all of the geocachers that we've lost throughout the year. Another part of life we all deal with as time rolls on. But a number of creative projects were also launched, or saw the light of day. The geocaching vlogger saw the release of his comic created with Rich Schlafer, the greatest treasure after a successful crowdfunding campaign. The Supernauts launched their personal geocoin after a campaign to raise funds on Kickstarter. And my Facebook group, Excellent Geocaching Adventures, saw the release of a new path tag, the Night Trip Glow in the Dark variant. And then on my TGI Friday monthly live stream, I held a How to Design a Path Tag event, which led to the launch of the TGIF Path Tag, which may be seen more as prizes coming in 2023. <laughs> Patrons had a private exclusive reveal of my Project EGA, which should be seeing light of day in 2023 as well, along with the continued development of a Cash the Line geocoin, which is now in final sample stages. 
And of course, we saw the launch of TGIF Geocaching Radio, this very monthly audio geocaching podcast. All in all, 2022 had its ups and downs, and after two hushed years of worldwide silence and anticipation, 2022 arrived in style. From first light on January 1st, the roller coaster of events through the year, and now to the winding down of another year in the books. 2023 has some big shoes to fill, but I think it's off to a good start. I want to thank you for following Cash the Line, for subscribing to this podcast, for chatting with me, for your encouragement and support, and to the patrons who pave the way for all of this by supporting financially and motivationally. And for you listening or watching or out in the trail finding a cash right now, or maybe about to try the hobby for the first time, all of this is for you. It has been a fantastic year, and I wish you the best in the new year. With 2023 around the bend, do you have any new goals to set for the new year? New geocaching achievements or places to visit? I'd love to hear from you. Email tgif at cashtheline.net or phone one in and leave a message at cashtheline.net slash POI. That, of course, includes any comments, funny stories, milestones, accomplishments, rants, and adventures. TGIF at cashtheline.net. Thanks for listening to the episode, and please remember to give this show a thumbs up or a positive review. Thank you to all the patrons who support Cash the Line. If you'd like to join the Band of Excellent Adventurers, please find us on Patreon or by visiting cashtheline.net slash Patreon. You can support CTL and get bonus swag and access to exclusive content for as little as a cup of coffee per month or with a discount by the year. See you next month and next year with more exploration into the world of excellent geocaching adventures. Please subscribe, follow, share with your friends, and comment where you're able. And as always, happy caching and excellent adventure. Thank you.